here, uh, not just here for the CME, but uh, if you are, I hope I make it worthwhile to stay anyway. Um, this is going to be a little bit different type of talk. I'm not going to use any research data. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more conceptual, so I'll change your focus, perhaps. Um, I'm going to raise, pose a couple of questions to start. Why is methadone maintenance uh, still considered to be controversial? Are people who object to methadone maintenance, or, uh, they have valid concerns, or are they just ignorant? Um, is methadone maintenance part of a recovery process, separate from it, or opposed to it? Uh, today I'll be discussing these questions within the context of my work over the past nine years in developing and directing a unique and innovative program at the Kirkbride Center in Philadelphia, where we offer methadone maintenance within a recovery-oriented residential rehab setting and aim to break down barriers between medical treatments and recovery. Um, to preface uh, my talk, I'd like to say a little bit about my background because it informs where I'm coming from and the direction of this, um, and especially how I came to methadone, which was uh, after I just worked not knowing anything about methadone in the addictions field for some time. Um, I did my uh, psychiatric training at the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital and psychoanalytic training at the Philadelphia Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, I worked at uh, my addiction psychiatry at the Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital. The whole thrust of the institute was a fairly high-end type of program, um, and it was very geared toward uh, psychotherapeutic approaches and integration of uh, psychotherapy, 12-step recovery, and uh, approaches. It was uh, psychiatrist-led, but not strictly medical model. Um, <coughs> what I mean by that is it uh, psychiatrist-led, but in a recovery model, as opposed to a medical model. I don't think you'll understand what I mean more by that. Um, so, fast-forwarding for a moment, as we went through the... Um, in the uh, 1990s, the Institute was essentially sliced and diced by managed care and folded in 1997, and suddenly on the same site was the Kirkbride Center, which has been there now for 11 years. Um, but the uh, mission of the Kirkbride Center is very uh, much geared toward treating the medical assistance population. Um, I tried to bring the same type of integrated approach to addictions treatment as we developed a rehab program at Kirkbride. And um, although we had very different resources than we had uh, and a very different patient population, uh, with the idea of physician-led program, uh, integration of psychiatry and recovery uh, was our focus. And fortuitously, at the same time, CBH uh, well, Health Choices was uh, coming into being in Pennsylvania, uh, Community Behavioral Health, CBH, uh, became the manager of, of uh, Mental Health and Substance Abuse Benefits in Philadelphia, and several people at CBH, uh, Roland Lamb among others, uh, I don't know if you were part of this at the time, but um, yeah. I think you were, um, were interested in, in also in breaking down barriers and, and, and in, in breaking down traditional barriers in the addiction street. And, um, you know, and, and uh, Roland's phrase was uh, to bring methadone assisted treatment across the spectrum of care. Um, in other words, asking the question, well, why, why do rehab programs, uh, why is it rehab or methadone that never, never integrate? Uh, why is rehab programs <coughs> methadone or some pariah of treatment? Um, and, and can patients who are appropriate for methadone benefit from a recovery-oriented treatment program? So we um, started Developing, uh, in fits and starts, we started developing a um, methadone residential rehab program. And we'll get into the, the uh, mechanics of that a little bit later, because that's part of, part of my talk and some of the unique features of it and some of the questions that it raises. Um, but I, I, I will say that you know, I've been practicing addiction psychiatry for about 11 years or so, and um, um, had never really had very little awareness treatment and I started treating patients with methadone. It was incredibly rewarding in this setting. Um, you know, 
know, I've certainly been around enough to see uh, how hopeless many opiate addicts uh, were and are, uh, going around and around in the treatment system, and never able to get a handle on their uh, addiction. And here is a treatment that we all in this room subscribe to, but that um, it gives people an opportunity to, um, for a different kind of lifestyle. So, I'm for a moment uh, this slide. This is a, uh, may seem a little unrelated, but it's, a, it's a, uh, an interesting article in the American Journal of Addiction several months ago that was actually a point-counterpoint type of presentation and raising the questions, are medications that reduce the risk of drinking or heavy drinking or that promote abstinence of value in the treatment of alcohol dependence? Um, you can translate to methadone or buprenorphine and opioid dependence. And, you know, the, the, the answer seems obvious at first. Of course, uh, they're helpful. Uh, we have double-blind studies that show that the um, campersate, the naltrexone, the pyramate also uh, reduce drinking frequency. Um, but the, the counterpoint to that was, yeah, that's fine. We reduce drinking frequency, but are we treating addiction? And what is treating addiction? And uh, is, is reducing drinking the same as treating addiction? And have we ever actually studied the effect of medications on the course of addiction? We now know that addiction is a chronic and long-term illness or disease, um, uh, neurobiological, behavioral, uh, cognitive, affective illness. And, um, and that the, the treatment for addiction is recovery process. In other words, um, what, what do I mean by, what is addiction? Um, addiction is, uh, when someone truly crossed that line and has the disease of addiction, um, they have developed neurologic pathways, um, behavioral and cognitive pathways, all in service of this illness. And um, recovery is not just to stop going down those pathways, but is to develop, is to, is to contain those pathways and to develop an alternative, uh, gradually, slowly, painfully, to develop alternative pathways, always with the risk, since those pathways are open and we don't like change so much as human beings, um, they're always there and they can always be gone down. We need to develop uh, the recovery process. So the, the take home point here is, that treating substance use behavior is not the same as treating addictive illness. Okay. Um, so, when we use pharmacotherapy, when we use methadone uh, in treatment, um, we're, we're using a medical intervention. Um, are we using that medical intervention separate from any awareness of the recovery process or are we trying to do it in the context of the recovery process. What I'm arguing for today is that we, pay, we attune ourselves to um, our interventions being in the context of recovery and, um, and, and we are aware of the ways that our, our medical treatments can actually act in a, in a counter to recovery. The key word on this slide, I would say, is, is responsibility. Um, when when a patient presents symptoms, and, I, and they come to me as a doctor, um, there's, a, there's a role dynamic there that um, you have your symptoms, and I'm your doctor. I'm going to treat you. I'm going to make it better. Um, the, the patient is in the passive role. I'm, respon I'm assuming responsibility for your symptoms, for your, your problems. Um, that is anathema to people in coming from recovery orientation. You cannot, we cannot actually medically treat addiction. Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, psychoanalytic addictions 
psychiatrist in Boston named Edward Cancy. He writes uh, some really uh, interesting, good stuff about uh, this. And he talks about um, the, the physician's role as a primary care therapist. Um, in other words, um, we can uh, offer the modalities. We can guide someone in the recovery process. We cannot treat the uh, addiction. We can, we can uh, offer the modalities such as methadone maintenance, such as um, family therapy, individual therapy, 12-step program. Look at the whole picture, and that's a, a very important role for us as physicians in evaluating and, and prescribing treatment. Um, I, I think historically, we in the medical field have not done uh, a great job with addictions, and that's why um, there's a lot of mistrust and disdain for uh, medicine, for psychiatry, and for methadone, uh, and, and for our interventions. People in the recovery community often look with suspicion on what we're doing, um, because perhaps because we've tried to treat them on, on a medical model, and we don't like to, as physicians, we don't really like to look at ourselves as um, not all powerful, say. Um, we like to think you know, we have the answer and we can, we can treat the addiction. And it's maybe a little bit humbling, but a little bit necessary to say, I, I can guide, but I can't treat you. The, the, the best example of this is when a patient has anxiety um, and, and they want uh, a benzoin. Our addict population are very good at using the code words that are going to get us to prescribe. Um, you know, it's not that I, you know, I, first of all, they don't know what they're feeling, especially coming out of an addiction. Um, it, um, you know, and it, but sadness becomes depression because you can do something for that, Doc. You give me something. I've got anxiety. What are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for me? Um, the responsibility from a recovery model, the responsibility for feelings is with the patient to manage through a recovery process. And, um, they need to learn to feel their feelings, not take something for them. Okay. Um, moving on. Some of the critiques that I hear from patients, from people in recovery, from family members, um, from staff that perhaps are uh, at times, it's just methadone is just being hooked on another drug. It's a substitute addiction. You're still addicted. You're not in recovery. You can never get off of it. Okay. Um, on another level, um, if, uh, you know, why are uh, psychiatry and addiction, I mean, we're trying to do a lot about this nowadays to integrate psychiatry, mental health and, and, and addiction treatment, but why are they so separate? Um, largely because we never knew what to do. With addictions, and they found their own way. So we have we have these reified structures where um, you know mental health is a is a medical uh, treatment, and substance abuse has largely been uh, you know, done by people who are recovering themselves, um, and they're, they're 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 split. And if, if, if substance abuse is the orphan child of psychiatry, methadone is the orphan child of addictions. Um, I guess, you know. You've got to have someone to kick, and, and, and it's, it's always been methadone. So, um, you know, all, all my time working on the Strecker program, which is an excellent program, I, I don't recall ever it being raised whether someone might be appropriate for methadone maintenance treatment. It was about 10 years on that program. It, was, it wasn't that, you know, people, maybe some people said, oh, that's not the only program or whatever. It just wasn't, it wasn't ever really considered. Okay, the other um, critique, I want, you, you get what we offer. Um, another problem in our, in our field is, uh, historically, has been that you, you go to methadone clinic, you get methadone treatment. You go to a rehab program, you get what they offer. Um, they don't talk about methadone. Um, where is the concept of, and as physicians, of diagnosis and prescription before treatment. And what is the actual uh, illness and what are the best modalities to treat someone? That, that should be the approach. Because that's not a critique of methadone, it's a critique of the, of the system. Um, the medical model combines with the system to encourage passivity. Um, if we're 5% uh, 
prescribing for a patient. There's an implicit message that I've described. Um, we also, also, the system tends to work to encourage people to be on methadone for long periods of time. Uh, if, you, if you get off it uh, and you get work, you might lose your benefits. You might, uh, you might still need to be on methadone. Okay. Um, I'm trying to keep within the time here, but just this last piece about problems with the clinics, I, I just would like to... Uh, something I observe, as because I, I see people from a lot of different clinics, and I, I talk to patients, and I'm, uh, I, I hear their experience in methadone programs, and I don't know... Um, patients in method, the patient methadone program is extremely vulnerable to... Uh, I think Dr. Taylor was talking earlier about how decisions should be made about uh, you know, administrative detox or, or about cutting dosage, anything of that nature, but they should be made by the medical director. I don't think that's always the case. Um, I don't know how else to say it. I'm trying to say it delicately, but, but people, uh, staff in methadone programs, they're not generally often well paid, they're not often uh, uh, very experienced or uh, certainly in, in recognizing transference, counter-transference type of conflicts. And uh, if a staff member gets punitive with a patient, um, they can threaten that person's essentially their, their life because if someone's cut off methadone, their um, you know, whole, whole world falls apart. And um, it's, it, it's, it, it's a, a reason why some patients fear going on methadone. They don't want to be chained to tied down. No one wants to be tied down, although you've been tied down with your addiction. Um, but uh, to be at the mercy of, of somebody is, um, can be problematic. Okay. So we developed this program. Um, and the reason I brought CBH into the, the picture, and then I'm, I mean, I'm speaking a little bit to some of those of you who are managed care, etc., because I think this is a model that hopefully um, can grow beyond the Philadelphia region or people might consider. Um, but it, it, it can only be done with a collaboration between managed care and, um, and the institution. For instance, um, we start people on methadone at Kirkbride. They don't have a clinic uh, at, at the time that we initiate. Uh, some, of them, some people do. We'll get to that in a moment. But um, so we initiate methadone maintenance treatment. We need to uh, guarantee, which we've been able to do for nine years, that, um, that if you complete the program, when you complete, you will be dosed here one day, you will be dosed at a clinic, at a clinic the next day, and you'll have absolute continuity. Now, under traditional managed care criteria, um, well, you know, there are these criteria, and if you don't meet them anymore, you're out the door. Um, we can't. You can't do methadone uh, if you if someone's going to be out the door before they have a clinic to go to. Um, so we've had to have a, an understanding, which we've had with CBH, and we've developed somewhat with Magellan now also, um, whereby um, we coordinate coordinate the care. Now, how did, uh, that's just one aspect of the collaboration. How does our program work? I'd like to describe that for a moment. Um, First of all, we treat a lot of method. We treat a lot of put a lot of patients on methadone maintenance at Kirk um, We have about 120 rehab beds, and at any given time, generally slightly more than half of them are methadone maintenance. Uh, right now, we have about 60 patients on methadone maintenance. Of those 60 patients, maybe eight or ten are coming from a methadone program in uh, somewhere in, anywhere in southeastern Pennsylvania, or the Lehigh Valley. Um, it may be referred because of benzodiazepines, cocaine, uh, co-occurring disorders, and, and uh, we treat them in a, in a methadone-friendly environment, which not all, all rehabs are. But, but the other 50 patients are patients that came in and were assessed for methadone and, and started on methadone uh, and, and are induced in an inpatient setting. Um, they are now CPH set up a, a set of crisis response center, CRC in Philadelphia, uh, where patients are, are accessed and are able to access 
the CBH data, and they come, this is not all of our patients, but many of our patients come pre-approved for 3A detox, 3B, or 3B with methadone maintenance. Now, um, not some, some of the 3A patients may become methadone maintenance, so we'll be getting to that. But if a patient is, and I'll listen to this because you may think it's controversial, and I suppose it is, um, if patients refer as 3B with methadone maintenance, um, that means that they are essentially being told, we will approve you for rehab contingent upon you're going on methadone maintenance. We're not approving detox. We're not approving drug free rehab. We're approving you only if you go on methadone maintenance. Now, I gave a similar talk to this at our uh, ESAN sponsored study group in Philadelphia a couple months ago, and some of the media responses were, that sounds coercive. Um, isn't that coercion? And um, you can call it coercion, you can call it limit setting, you can um, <laughs> fight, uh, and you can call it, and maybe we've got time for questions, you can call it what you like, but, um, <laughs> um, but um, you know, I wouldn't do it if I didn't feel completely ethically comfortable with it. And I think the, the message is, and, and here, um, here's a typical patient, Carl, 37 years old, 16 years of heroin addiction, multiple rehabs, um, only time he's had any clean time is he's incarcerated. I don't want to be on, I don't want methadone maintenance. I just want to be off everything. I never really, I, I, and now it's different because I've never really wanted it before. I always try to get clean for someone else. Um, this person would typically be referred, be, be told, um, we're not, we have, we have, we're the, uh, we're managing public funds and we're not going to pay for you to go through another rehab. Uh, unless you, if you agree to go on methadone, um, you may have a chance to change the cycle that you've been and you go on a different pathway. And that's what we're offering you. And that's, um, now, the deal, um, when people sign on, and I try to be very clear because it's not, uh, it's not always so clear. Uh, people have never encountered this, this type of this position before unless they've been around the last few years and come to us uh, a couple of other times. Um, again, this is not, most of our patients are seeking, so this is not uh, an aversive uh, uh, thing, but um, when, when, you, when I, what I tell them is, uh, we're going to start you on methadone maintenance, you will not be detoxed, you will not have the opportunity to come off it when you leave, unless you have, there are exceptions to every rule, if you're going, going, if you're going to be incarcerated, uh, having uh, an adverse reaction, etc. But um, you know, you you, you um, can accept this treatment or not. That's that's your choice. But this is what's, what's being offered to you. And when you leave, you will be. I will guarantee you that you will have a clinic to go to. Um, and we refer to there are eleven clinics in Philadelphia and we've got some in the city also. Um, okay. Um, here's another patient with a little bit more uh, insight. Uh, and and, and my, most patients, contrary to perhaps the popular myth, um, and we probably see this in urine settings, most patients are not that eager to be on methadone maintenance. It's, not, it's like the myth that, that addiction is some kind of fun thing um, that, that people choose and, and, and enjoy, um, which is not at all. Methadone is not, it's, it's, it's a lot of hassle, but it's an opportunity for people to get serious about turning their lives around. Um, I get three months clean, get a job, start believing in myself, and I pick up one day, and everything goes down the tubes. Um, at, this, at least this way, maybe I can sustain something. <coughs> really want it. Okay. So, some of the uh, advantages, and I'm going to do a couple more cases to, to illustrate. We get the opportunity, and, you know, to, to offer methadone not only to the people that are as clear as that, in the cases I just presented, but uh, to people who otherwise would not find their way onto methadone treatment. Um, Donna came to us for detox. Four years of uh, of opioid abuse, heroin the last 18 months. Um, 
she went on a standard five-day detox protocol from 30 to zero. Um, asked to see me, tense cravings, withdrawal symptoms, but she doesn't want methadone maintenance. I said, okay, you know, not everybody detoxes smoothly in five days. Um, let's, you're, you're approved for rehab. Let's extend your taper. Let's work with, let's work with this. Um, try to go through a slower taper. Some of your abuse was oxycontin. It's longer acting. Let's, let's try to work with you. Got down to five milligrams. Same experience. At this point, I said, um, she still didn't want methadone maintenance. I said, um, okay, we can try one more round of this. But if you're still feeling this way at the end of one more round of, of attempted detox, I think it's, it's an indication that you're not making it and um, you really need to consider something else. Um, and she did. And she went on nothing and completed the program. It also gives us the opportunity, uh, I want to say about the other, another way that, that, that the managed care facilitates, because there's a, uh, a big database on, on patients that CPH has now uh, collected, and um, it's very useful. Um, some of these patients that come in mandated for methadone, I might evaluate them and, say, and they say, look, I, I don't think they should be mandated for methadone. I think this person may have a, a, a nasty opiate history, but they, they've been put together two years of, um, of drug-free recovery. They're working a program. They've got, had some stability. They had a setback, a loss, or whatever. They had a relapse, and they did the right thing. They said, you know, I don't want to live this way. Um, you know, they relapsed maybe a month ago. They come in for treatment. Um, and I say to CBH, well, you know, this person shouldn't be mandated. They, they should have the opportunity for drug-free rehab. And CBH might say, okay, or they might say, well, that's interesting, but in our database, this person's presented at detox six months ago and eight months ago and uh, 12 months ago. So this um, period of recovery is, is a bit of a myth. And, um, we, you know, we, we generally, when we get as much, as much of the data on the table as we can, we pretty much agree. Um, this uh, program, this, and, and, and you know, it's, it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, it's not. We, we have our pro uh, problems, but I'm trying to uh, uh, highlight that uh, what, what we're able to do in this in this setting, and really with limited resources, um, and um, we get the opportunity to manage co-occurring disorders. Don was a very interesting young uh, man. Yeah, very interesting young woman. Um, she had a, a, not, not an unusual addiction history, but a, a real comorbid uh, psychiatric and substance abuse history. Severe, repetitive sexual trauma in childhood, uh, a long uh, history of depression, self-mutilation, multiple hospitalizations and rehabs. She had ECT. Um, she became heroin dependent at age 18. Now she's 29. She tolerated the detox, no problem. She's in rehab. Um, Ten days after the detox, she um, was experiencing these tense, in, intense urges to self-mutilate. I saw her as a psychiatric consultation, um, started going into her history, got all this background, and found out that she's experiencing, even though she had no withdrawal, she's experiencing intense opiate cravings. She's uh, terrified that she's going to go out and destroy her life again. Uh, she's in a, in a good marriage, and um, but, but her husband has said, I, I can't deal with this anymore. You go into rehab, and, and, and um, if you relapse again, I, I can't stay with you anymore. Um, this is an individual, both these individuals would probably never have found a way to methadone maintenance. This, this was not something that she or I was considering when I first started to talk with her. Um, but that's where she went. Um, she panicked. We got the husband involved. He was supportive, and, um, and she was able to uh, successfully make that transition. Okay. So, and, and I want to make the point that um, in this day and age, um, a buprenorphine-assisted <coughs> uh, recovery program is really waiting to happen. 
Um, but are these agonist treatments, do they facilitate, uh, and how can they be seen as a facilitator of recovery? How is an impediment to recovery? Um, and I, I talk with patients about this all the time. Um, now, I'm not talking about harm reduction, which I'm not opposed to. I'm not, I don't mean harm reduction in the sense of heroin maintenance, but I mean harm reduction for people who are chronic recidivist addicts who are, who are better off being on methadone for the rest of their lives and you know, may not be 100% drug free. Um, I, I'm fine with that, but I'm talking about people like these. Uh, we see a lot of young people, a lot of young uh, women, heroin, Oxycontin, et cetera. Um, you know, who are scared of going on this for the rest of their lives. Um, methadone as a facilitator of recovery, again, it's not recovery in a tablet or a liquid, um, but we talk in terms of it being a stepping stone, uh, laying a foundation for, for recovery, buying time. Um, so if you're going on methadone, don't just accept it as though that is your treatment. Go on methadone and use the time that you have on methadone to, 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 you know, to keep these addiction pathways at bay and develop these recovery pathways. And that's not going to happen in a month or two or three. That's, going to t that's why we always recommend at least a year. Um, but um, build your recovery while you have the, protect the protection, the foundation. It's, and coming off it is not going to be purely a physiologic issue. If you have built some emotional stability, supports around you, you have uh, work, some kind of recovery program, perhaps you're in psychotherapy or you have pharmacotherapy that's indicated. Um, as opposed to how can methadone be an impediment to recovery? Um, well, I'll take the methadone and, you know, but stay, keep my, my thinking processes, everything along these addictive pathways. I'll try to get benzos if I can, I'll try to get other drugs. But methadone, you know, makes me uh, a more functional addict in the sense that I can still, you know, I, I, I don't have to uh, feed my habit every day, but I can, um, you know, I can still keep numb. I can get the doctor to give me more than I need. Um, I can avoid emotion. Um, and I, or I can be, if I'm a predator, I can, um, you know, use it as a, as a uh, means to, uh, there's plenty of people to prey on in the methadone uh, world, and that's, that's a whole other issue, a whole other problem. Um, is it part of your addiction or part of your recovery? Are you taking, I try to talk, I, I, when I prescribe buprenorphine, I, I, do, I tell people I want them to move from taking it as a drug to taking it as a medication. That's the goal of the initiative and the induction of treatment. Um, we try to get away from your focus on what am I taking, what am I not taking, do I need more, do I need less, what am I feeling? Um, and, and get some stability, set that all aside, and focus on your life and focus on developing these recovery pathways. Okay. Um, patients often ask me um, from the rest of the medical world in some ways. Benzos are not, are uncommon, even the rest of the addictions people, benzos are uncommon as a drug of choice except in this population. They are a drug of choice in the methadone maintenance um, population. I will argue that they are extremely hard, if not impossible, to control in the methadone setting, and that few patients can manage them only therapeutically. Um, benzodiazepines are very effective in giving immediate relief from anxiety. Um, but is it anxiety we're talking about? Um, sometimes yes, but or is anxiety just a code word? First of all, someone coming out of an addiction is used to not feeling anything. So any, any feelings are raw, and they want them to go away. Um, and these will make them go away. If you look at it from the medical model, the medical model perspective, I have a symptom of anxiety, and you got you, and as a doctor, a compassionate doctor, you should give me something for that symptom. From the recovery model, what's the difference between uh, your, your desire for benzo is just a craving for benzodiazepine. How is it any different from a craving for any other drug? And um, fortunate, un well, for opiates, we have good drug cravings. 
We don't have them for, uh, we, have, we have some uh, pharmacotherapies for cravings and other areas, but nothing compares with methadone and buprenorphine in terms of, uh, of the relief it gives and the efficacy. Um, we don't have any equivalent for benzos of a safe um, benzo, something that, that gives the relief without causing the problems. I think a lot of people thought clonopin was that magic bullet for several years. Clonopin, in my experience, is certainly by far the second most commonly abused benzo after Xanax uh, these days. Um, so, um, increasing the methadone dosage, I think we had a comment earlier. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, patients where that's been tried. I, I think that's a failed strategy. I, I think um, that I don't think anyone would really argue with that. But, but you know, patients can be can. Is there a lot of pressure for relief? Um, my own experience um, at Kirkbride over, over the years with this, I've gotten more hard line as time has gone on because I, I, I generally will prescribe, will allow people to be on benzos in our program um, if they are part of a stabilization regimen for a major psychiatric illness, uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And there are some patients who are just going to be destabilized coming off them. I don't prescribe them for anxiety disorders. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit more fortunate because I have a controlled environment and what happens out there, I don't have control over and I, I don't have to worry much about. Um, but if I'm sending them to your clinic, I'm going to send them benzo free. Um, um, and and the, the, the reason I've come to that harder line is because when I try to uh, differentiate, I found that I have no clue who is conning me and who is not. Uh, in terms of, and, and, and most of the times that I've prescribed them for anxiety problems, I end up regretting it. And not only that, but as soon as one person's got them, I've got ten other people who, have, you know, what do you say to the doc? How do you get them? You know, and I've got, you know, um, so. Okay. I'm going to wrap up. And, um, this is the question I raised earlier, why not uh, the orphan assisted we have. Okay, hopefully I have a couple of questions. Thank you. So we, have, uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, what is your uh, feeling about the uh, uh, person, the psychiatrist, who says, uh, you've got to be clean for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, three months before we'll treat your depression, your bipolar disorder, etc. Um, well, first of all, I disagree, but uh, I think I, I, I think that, in my experience, um, first of all, it can be very difficult to differentiate early on what the symptoms represent. I've seen a lot of people get treated for bipolar disorder. In, a, well, in an inpatient psychiatric unit when their <coughs> bipolar symptoms are essentially opiate withdrawal symptoms um, and, and their irritability and um, pressure behavior was, was really that. Um, I have the luxury of having, I think we all do actually, if you have someone in a treatment program, I, I like to take some time to diagnose. When I'm confident that, that there's a diagnosis, whether it's the first day or a week later or a month later, I will we'll medicate. I don't think there's any rationale for arbitrarily holding patients in that way. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question in the comment. First of all, I thank you for your comment on benzodiazepines. I came to the same conclusion the longer I work in the field, the, 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 the more of a hardliner I become with respect to benzodiazepines and methadone. But secondly, I wanted to ask you the question. There was a couple things on your slides about holistic treatment and uh, science versus spirituality. I don't really think why these should be divided. But I was trying to uh, listen attentively to your definitive opinion about you know, spirituality and holistic treatment in addiction. So the reason for that is that I believe that treatment of addictions definitely involves much more than just abstinence from a substance. And it also involves filling that void that opens up after the substance behavior is terminated. And that's where I believe spirituality would be very helpful. I appreciate your comment. I think uh, 
you know, it speaks to the limits of what we can do as physicians, but that we have a, a very, when we get out of the mindset that we have to prescribe something, we can do a lot more than we think. Um, patients really look up to us. They'll respect us for not pulling out the pad immediately and for offering guidance. Um, a lot of these people don't really, they're lost. They don't know where to go. And um, giving them direction in terms of how to uh, find a recovery path is very valuable. I do have a, a comment and question. Um, methadone, as I understand it, obviously it's a potent new agonist. But it also has some, my understanding, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibition activity, as well as anti-glutamate activity. And I, I wonder if in, I guess it was Anne, who was having uh, panic and anxiety and, and feelings of self-harm, et cetera, if, if putting her on the methadone, if that didn't kick that in somehow. Because I know, it, like, tramadol is, is similar. It's a mu agonist peak, but mu agonist with SNRI activity for the acute and chronic pain. But that SNRI activity, I, I wonder, it, is, is it strong enough to actually be therapeutic and, and replace, you know, Cymbalta or some of, some of the other SNRIs? Um, well, you could probably answer from a pharmacologic perspective better than I can, but I think you just can offered some interesting thoughts. I think in the case of Anne, um, I, I, she was not on, on pharmacotherapy, actually, uh, other than the methadone that she went on. She settled down significantly. Um, I, I think, she, you know, when I went through her long psychiatric history, medication had been fairly ineffective for her. Um, I think she's suffering from sequelae of a severely damaged childhood. Um, I think she was a courageous uh, young woman. Um, and, uh, you know, I think she had you know, post-traumatic uh, symptoms. And, and, uh, but uh, she was in a, a, a crisis that she could not identify at that point in time. And, and the crisis was that she was about to go destroy her life. Um, thank you. You mentioned there is nothing that you can do for mental dependence. Uh, some persons use uh, propanolol, which is cheap, and it works, and it's used for uh, anxiety, it's changed for performance, whatever. What's your opinion? Well, let, let, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I didn't mean to imply that I just tell people there's nothing I can do for you, or that I don't try to assist them pharmacologically, because I do. It's just nothing's going to feel to them like a benzo. Um, you know, we. we um, I've used propranolol more for when there's tremulousness associated. Um, I've used, we use Mistaril uh, hydroxyzine quite commonly. Um, some patients want uh, clonidine. Um, you know, a lot of people are using Seroquel. I use it more when there's significant post-traumatic stress. Uh, I find it helpful at night. Um, sometimes low dose during the day. Um, someone has who is potentially as disorganized as Anne. I, I've used Thorazine uh, in low doses. Um, it's not much in vogue these days, but it works. Um, so there are a variety of pharmacologic approaches. And I also, I think the, the, the conundrum, the real problem with the benzos is, in my experience, most patients have done surprisingly well coming off them. But there are patients who, where that, that trench is gouged pretty deeply in terms of benzos being a, a pathway. Um, and if they've been on them for years, um, you know, if I were treating them outpatient, I might try, uh, you know, what Laura was saying about uh, very tightly controlled prescribing. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think um, there are some patients where it just seems to be unrealistic to expect them to um, to be completely free of them when they 